Good day, great tens. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with trigonometry. But before we do that, I want to ensure that you guys know how to enroll into the grade 10 maths class. So if you've already enrolled, awesome. If not, just watch quickly and we'll show you how to do it. So the first thing you do is you go to your internet browser, whether it be Firefox or Chrome or whatever you use, and or Edge, and basically you need to type in www.toenable.org, okay? And you'll come to this landing page here. First time users, um, you're the people I'm actually talking to. Basically, what you need to do is you need to register first. You need to type in your name and your surname and your email address, and then you can register. If you have already registered, then you can just type in your email address and your password. And you can nice thing is you can click the Remember Me button. And then what happens is that you don't have to worry about that password again and you click the login button. When you do that, you get to this page. Your page is only going to have choose subject, progress and results uh, and to enable help online. Right. So then what you need to do is you need to go and press the choose subject box. And when you pre choose a Press the choose subject box. You'll come to pages got hundreds of, of different subjects that you can enroll in, and you guys are going to choose the grade 10 maths, and you're going to click enroll. At that point, it's this the program will kick you back to this screen, and you'll now have this nice blue block that says maths grade 10. So you'll now know that you have enrolled in the maths grade 10 class. Now. One of the reasons I want you to do this is that we, I can run live assessments with you guys and I can check how you guys are doing. Now remember that this live assessment, firstly, you don't have to do it while we are on the lesson. You can do it anytime you want. What we mean by live is that it's running on the internet. I'll leave it live for two or three days and it's a multiple choice questionnaire. So it's fairly quick, but you obviously have to do calculations. It's not multiple guess. And the point of it is that I don't get individual results, but I get a graph. So I will see that 50% oh, of the class didn't understand question three. So then I will go look at whatever question three was and I'll see, oh yes, question three was on such and such. Let me go reteach that. And then I set up a time for you guys to get and reteach that for you. Okay, so that's why we do that. Next, you click up can click upcoming events. That's where you click to view the live session. So we click it and you come up with this looking this website. It looks like this. OK, this page. Now, depending on how many classes you've enrolled into, OK, you will have a different number of upcoming events. Most importantly, you find the one you want and you click view event. OK. And you come to this little pop up and then you need to click the blue button that says open live TV link. And then you will get to this page and you do have the option to open the feed in a new tab. And I would suggest you do that because it does make the screen a bit bigger. And most importantly, you need to click, click the green button that says join the event as a guest, not the sign in as an event team member, okay? The join the event. So you click it and you come to the lesson, ta-da! And then you get to watch the lesson. Now, the reason that I want you guys to really um, enroll in the class is because then you can message the studio and you can message me and you can talk to me about different things that you want to cover. For example, we're doing functions at the moment, but if you really, really need help with a certain section, then you could say, um, Candice, please, I'm desperate. I need help with such and such. And if I haven't already covered it in the last two or three weeks and you just missed it, then I will organize to when I'm finished functions to go onto that section. Um, or if you've got specific questions that you really don't understand, then you can talk to me and we can make a plan. Okay, so please note also that that message studio button, okay, this message studio button only works, only works when, sorry, I don't know what happened, I've lost my pen. Okay, <laughs> there it is. It only works, sorry about that, when, um, um, when it's live. Okay, so you could have pressed this button here if you missed the live session. So say you missed the live session and you desperately want to watch what we are doing on functions, then you can come back. So say you've got sport on, okay? At three o'clock on Wednesdays, you have got, 
I don't know, hockey. And you obviously, or whatever, tennis, yucks gay, I don't care what you have, okay? Or you've got something else on, okay? And you can't actually be at the live recording or be on your, your iPad or your cell phone or your laptop or your computer, whatever, at the time of the recording. Then what you can do is you can actually go and watch the recording afterwards. Obviously, the downside is that you can't message me because this message button only works during the live session. Okay, so let's get on with doing functions. So the first thing we need to talk about what is a function and the easiest way for me to explain what a function is, is to give you an example. So what we have here is this equation where y is equal to 3x plus 5. And this is how I usually introduce functions in my classes and it seems to get the guys to understand what a function is. So let's go through it. What I want to do is I want to substitute minus 2 um, that's supposed to say minus one, my apologies, zero and two into this equation here and see what we get for the y values, okay? So if we do that, we've got y is equal to three times minus two plus five, which is minus six plus five, which is minus one. So that's minus one. Okay, if x is minus one, then you've got y is equal to three times minus one, plus 5, so you get minus 3 plus 5, which equals 2. If x is naught, you've got y equals 3 times by naught plus 5, which is just going to be 5. And if y is equal to, I mean, x is equal to 2, you've got 3 times 2 plus 5, which is going to be 11. So what am I proving? I'm proving that as x changes, so does y, okay? So x is called the independent variable. x is the independent variable. It is the one that we're changing. And y is the dependent variable, the dependent variable. And do you see that for every x value, there is one and only one y value. When x is minus two, we get y equals minus one. When we don't get two options. We don't get minus one or three, okay? Your option, your answer is when x is minus two, y is minus one. When x is minus one, y is two, et cetera, et cetera. So the formal definition of a function, the formal definition, and guys, amazingly, sometimes they actually ask you this definition. Okay, so you need to know it. For every x value, there is one and only one y value. For every x value, there is one and only one y value. So all these things here, all of them, and guys, you're probably not going to come across most of these. You're going to come across a line, a polynomial. You're not going to do Gaussian or Lorentzian. You'll do exponential. You won't do double. You'll do a sine. You won't do a hill. We won't do a sigmoid. Log normal and maybe a power. Yeah. Okay. So those, but all of these, all of these are functions. And how do I know this? Well, there's a trick. And it's called this ruler trick, okay? The vertical line test. It's actually called the vertical line test. Okay, think about it. The rule says for there is for every x, for every x, there is one and only one y value. So if I had to draw a vertical line using my ruler, how many times should I cut this graph? If this was a function, I would only cut the graph once, okay? But I don't. I cut the graph over here and I cut the graph over there. So whatever x value this is, I'm getting two y values. So let's say, for example, this would be x and this would be y1 and that would be x and this would be y2. We don't know what those y values are, we don't know what the x value is, but the point is that this is not a function. It is a graph, but it's not a function because how is a function defined? That for every x value, there is one and only one y value. Okay, so I'm just showing you again that if we take our ruler, and unfortunately I couldn't get a thing that let, let me drag the ruler across, I was very sad. So I've basically <laughs> taken it and just 
done a little snap to grid thing here. So if you go straight line, do you see you only cross it once? With exponentials, you only cross it once. With sigmoid, you're only crossing it once, okay? Similarly with Gaussian, sine, and power. So basically, any place along here, I can draw a vertical line, and you'll notice that I'm only crossing the graph once, compared to if my graph looked like something like this, Okay, which would be basically the 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 this rotated um, by ninety degrees. Then do you agree that that would not be a function because I would cut this graph four times four. Okay, so therefore it would not be a function. Okay, so there you go. Now let's just again just remind you that x is the independent variable and that's your input variable the number that we change that is what we change and it is obviously then on the x-axis we will talk about that in a minute the y is the dependent or the output variable and it depends it depends on the x value that you put in okay it depends on the x value so for example, we would y is equal to 2x. So this is a very basic example. So obviously if x equals 1, then you've got y equals 2. If x equals minus 1, y is going to equal minus 2, etc, etc, etc. So that is a very basic example of where you've got a x being the independent variable and y being the dependent variable. But now before we can carry on, we need to talk about set notation because when we talk about functions, we need to talk about things called domains and ranges. And in order to really understand the domain and range and be able to write out the domain and range for a graph, and we are going to explain that to you. And you guys, it's quite late in the year, so you guys should know what domains and ranges are. Um, when we when we when we write ask to write it down we need to use the right notation okay so what they've told us here this is a set notation it's saying that x is an element of real values for x is smaller than zero x is an element of real numbers for x is smaller than zero so do you agree what we're saying and so i would write that down i would say x is an element of real numbers, numbers, but x is smaller than, oh, that's not going to help, is it? Is smaller than zero. So if I had to draw a number line and I put zero here, okay, that's my zero. Do you, actually, let me put the number at the top. Let me put the number at the top. Okay. Do you agree that the numbers that we're talking about are from zero and everything below zero, but not including zero because it's smaller than zero? So it would be an open circle and then everything smaller. So it would be, but remember it's a real value. So it's going to be minus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, etc., etc., all the way to minus infinity all the way to minus infinity. Okay, now let's look at this one. We've got y is an element of natural numbers, natural numbers, natural. Okay, natural numbers for y is smaller than or equal to three and bigger than or equal to minus four. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Because, okay, so first of all, let's think of a number line. Do you agree that what are we looking at? We're looking at the values. They have gone from minus four through to, and I'm gonna write it minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so, what is special about the natural numbers? What can you guys tell me about natural numbers if I had to ask you? Do you remember that we spoke about counting numbers and natural numbers and real numbers and um, rational numbers? Do you remember that? We spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. And 
we spoke about the fact that natural numbers were specifically what? Okay, what? Natural numbers were the positive whole numbers from one. Okay, so this is interesting because even though y is between minus one and three, it can't actually be anything below zero. Because the way it worked was that the natural numbers is how you would naturally count. So it includes one, it includes two, and it includes three. Counting numbers count from zero, and rational numbers are from minus four up, and real numbers are from minus four up. So even though this set theory says that y is an element of natural numbers, for y is smaller than or equal to three and greater than minus four, we cannot include that. So actually, this is an interesting one. The only things that are valid here are, and I'm going to do it at the top of the sum, 1, 2, and 3. Those are the only numbers that are valid within the set. Okay, if this had been real, okay, then it would have been from minus 4, through to three, that would have been if it is real. If it had been rational numbers, then it would have been minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and three. Okay, but because of the fact that it was natural numbers, we're only looking at those three numbers there. Hmm, quite a tricky one, hey? Right, now let's look at the next one. Now it says x is an element of z. So what is z? Sorry, z are integers. Z are integers, okay? So z are integers, and they all the integers for x is greater than 100. Okay, so obviously we can't write these all these integers down because integers are your whole numbers. Sorry, that's what I meant by the other one. Integers are your whole numbers. So this is 100. We're going for all the numbers bigger than one. So the next integer or whole number, which is bigger than 100, is 101. So we're looking at 101, 102, 103, 104. Okay, so integers are whole numbers all the way up to infinity. So that is what we are looking at there. So we're obviously not expected to write that on our on our number line because obviously I'm not expecting you to do dots for into infinity. Okay, but basically what you need to do is be able to understand this and read this. Okay, now let's talk interval notation. So the interval notation is different. So what this is saying is that Basically, they're including all the numbers between 2 and 10. And how do I know it's between 2 and 10? Square brackets. Square brackets mean not included. Not included. So another way I could write this is I could say x is smaller than 10 and bigger than 2. Okay? Or if I did a number line, here would be 2 and here would be 10. There'd be a circle at an open circle of the 2 and an open circle of 10, and it would be everything between them. Or you could say that it, you would write this as x is between 2 and 10. Okay. Whereas, yeah, x is from 2 to 10. Okay, x is from 2 to 10. Okay, so therefore we're including your 2 and your 10 now. So therefore it's going to be from 2 through to 10. So what we would have to do is, let me just correct my, actually let me just correct this. It is going to be a number line. And it's going to be 2 and 10 and this time I'm including it. So therefore it has got a beautiful closed circle. Now this one is going to be what? It is not including 10, but it a 2, but it is including 10. Okay, so this one is including 2, but not including my 10. 
Okay, so in other words, it's from 2, but not 10. Okay, so it's between 2 and from 10. I mean, between 2 and 10, but including 2. Now they're saying write the following in set notation. So we would say that x is an element of real values for x is smaller than 3 and greater than or equal to minus 6. And you've got to have your curly brackets. And this could have been y. It doesn't matter. I'm just using x. Okay. Yeah. Again, x is an element of real values. For x is smaller than, sorry, x is bigger than minus infinity and smaller than equal to 3. And you understand that x cannot equal minus infinity or infinity, okay? Because you can't equal the end of the universe. So there we go, okay? So now they're asking us to write this in interval notation. So we've got k as an element of real values. For k is going, let's draw this on a number line. It's going from minus 3 to 10, okay? It's not including minus 3, but it is including 10. So I would go, this is minus 3, 10. This is going to have to be a square bracket, and this is an open bracket, a curly bracket. Okay. Yeah, we've got x is an element of real values for x is greater than 12. So if we had to draw this on a number line, do you agree this would be 12? It'd be an open circle going all the way to positive infinity. So therefore we'd go 12 infinity curly bracket. Okay, guys, you really need to know how to be able to draw these out because they could ask you to write the range using interval notation or they could ask you to write it using set notation. So you guys need to practice and make sure you understand. Okay, now let's talk about function notation. Okay, normally we'll write it, a function as an expression like this. Y is equal to 3x plus 4. Now, I could give you... That y is equal to x squared, okay? And that is not a function. So when we say we express a function like this, what we mean is that that could be a function or it could not be a function. But if it is a function, then we would write it as f of x is equal to 3x plus 4. And the way we say it is f of x is equal to 3x plus 4, just like I said it. Now, normally, people write f of x, meaning a function. The function of x is equal to 3x plus 4. But obviously, if you are looking at more than one function at a time, you can't let them all be f of x, okay? So we can use anything. We can use g of x, p of x, t of x, q of x. It doesn't matter. All we're saying is that this answer here is dependent on that function, or dependent on that expression. Okay, this answer here is dependent on that expression. That's what we're really saying. Okay, so let's look at an example. It says f of x is equal to 3x plus 4, and it asks us to find f of minus 2. So what they're saying is that, what they're saying here is that wherever we see an x, we need to write minus 2. So we're saying that x equals minus 2, and we want to know what f of minus 2 is. Do you agree that's exactly the same as saying y is 3x plus 4, but now we're going to substitute minus 2 in to find the y value. So that becomes 3 of, times by minus 2 plus 4, which is minus 6 plus 4, which is minus 2. So therefore, f of minus 2 happens to equal to minus 2. So, Another example, exactly the same thing, but again, just showing you that it doesn't matter what we choose, but this time we're doing it the other way around. Last time we said, find f of minus two. Okay, so this time we, sub that time we substituted x equal to minus two into it and we wanted to know what the value of the function was. Now, we're saying that the whole function is equal to 13 and we wanna know what is the x value. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that 13 is equal to 3x plus 4, and they're saying find x. So when 
we substitute x into this expression, the whole expression equals 13. That's what it's really saying. So we can substitute, we can do that. We can go 13 minus 4 is equal to 3x. So 9 is equal to 3x. So x is equal to 3. There you go. Now, let's talk about representing a function. Now, there are a couple ways to represent a function, and we're going to go through all the different ways. Um, the chances are great tense that if when you do the function section, then your teacher will teach you about the mapping and everything else, the mapping the table and the graph. And then they'll probably examine you, possibly examine you on the mapping and the table in the first two or three tests that you do on functions and possibly in the gene exams. But when it comes to grade 11 and 12 functions, they don't really examine you on mapping anymore. Okay, but I'm still going to show you just in case your teachers do decide to test you on it. Okay, so the way mapping works is you told your function is y is equal to 2x plus 4. And then you basically have what is called a spider diagram. And it doesn't have to have eight legs, the spider diagram. And what you're doing is you're mapping. You're saying when x equals minus 3, what is my output going to be? And I'm sorry, the lines are skewed. So you go 2 times minus 3 plus is equal to minus 1. When x is naught, then my function is going to be 5. When x is 2, my function is 2 times 2 is 4 plus 5 is 9. So there you go. You can see how you've mapped it. So you're basically taking your input sending it through the function box and it gives you an output okay now the other way of doing it is doing a table which we've actually kind of already looked at okay and this is where you say what the input is and the output is and you just substitute in so again when x equals minus three we get that this is minus one this is zero and this is nine easy peasy right now like i said with mapping in the table we don't actually usually get asked to draw it. We sometimes draw the table to help us plot a graph, but what we usually get asked to do, and I'll talk to you now about the set of water pairs in a minute, we usually asked to do is draw a graph. Okay, so like I said, there are three ways that you can represent a function. The one is a mapping, the other one is a table, and the third is a graph. And 90% of the time, you guys, or the 99% of the time, you're going to be asked to draw a graph. Okay, so let's talk about the set of ordered pairs. This year is an ordered pair. This is an ordered pair. Oh, that's supposed to be a five, sorry. And that's an ordered pair. So what we're saying is that when x equals minus three, the output is minus one. When x is naught, y is five. When x is two, y is nine. So I can write them as ordered pairs. I can say minus three, minus one, naught, five, and two, nine. And you guys will recognize those as x, y coordinates of a point on a graph, okay? And that's exactly what it is. These are points on a graph, okay? That's what we worked out. So again, we've said that our ordered pairs are minus three, minus one, naught, five, and two, nine. So now we can plot it on this graph. Now, when you draw graphs, grade tens, you need to be drawing them with a pencil, okay? You shouldn't really use a ruler unless you definitely are drawing a straight line. Um, and even when you use a ruler, you need to still draw a best fit line. And you need an eraser. And the reason you need an eraser is because, let's say you make a mistake. Let's say you draw a line like this and it's supposed to be like that, okay? I don't wanna see that, that's horrible. You actually need to take out your eraser and do this. Okay, so it's nice and clear. Um, and it's very important that you actually get into the habit of drawing these things with pencils. And the reason I say that is because of the fact that in the final exams you get a in matric, okay, and possibly in your classes now, in your wherever you'd get taught, you get one graph per exam paper. And if you draw it in pen, then 
and then try and to fix it out, you're going to end up with a horrible mess, okay, and then you're going to end up losing marks. So rather draw it with a pencil. So let's plot these points. We want this ordered pair means that this is x when x is minus 3, y is minus 1. When x is naught, y is 5. Oh, sorry. When x is naught, y is 5. And when x is 2, y is 9. So when x is minus 3, y is minus 1. When x is naught, y is 5. Um, and when x is 2, y is 9. Now again, I would say to you, because we can see that this is obviously a straight line graph, I would use a ruler to draw this, but unfortunately, I don't have the option on my software, so I have to do the best I can. Okay, which is not very good. Okay, so you guys need to use a ruler specifically when you have a straight line. When you have a straight line. Okay, and this should be a perfect straight line because you've actually plotted it. It's not like you were given data points and then hope for the best, okay? So, therefore, you need to draw use a ruler. Okay, so now let's talk about the domain. The domain is basically the part that the graph stretches out across the x-axis. In other words, if I had to take the x-axis and look all the way along here and all the way along here, would I still be able to find a graph? In other words, where on the x-axis does this graph end? And you can see that this graph carries on, this arrow actually indicates that this graph is going to carry on forever and ever and ever and ever that way. And this graph is going to carry on ever and ever and ever and ever this way. So what does that mean? It means it's going all the way from positive infinity, it's just going to keep going, okay, all the way to minus infinity. So if you had to use your interval, okay, the, the, the set notation, we're going to write x is an element of real values. For x is smaller than infinity and greater than minus infinity. Okay, and that would be your domain. Now let's talk about your range. Your range is your y values. The y values that your your graph is getting to stretch across. So again, you'd think about where on this would the actual graph stop. If I had to look at my y values, where would the graph stop? And again, if you look at this, you can see that the graph goes on forever and ever, ever going all the way down, and it carries on forever and ever, ever always going up. So therefore, my range would be y is an element of real values, for y is smaller than infinity and greater than minus infinity. Okay, right. Now, I find that a lot of students struggle to remember which one is domain and which one is range. And the easy way for me to remember it is that range has got a G in it, which means it's got like a little leg. And Y has got a little leg. So that means that the ranges and the Y belong together. And domain and X don't break the line. In other words, if you have to write it, if you did, remember when you were at school and junior school and you had to write things and it was do main do you see that you don't go below the line whereas with range if you're drawing a g you go down the line it's got a leg and so does the y which is why the range is the y value okay that's just the way i remember it okay now straight line graphs so we've kind of spoken about straight line graphs already but let's get more specific so, the standard form of the equation is y is equal to mx plus c, where m, as you guys know, is your gradient, or if you want, it's the slope, the slope, okay? And c is where it cuts the, cuts the y-axis, okay? Axis, really can this axis. Or it's called the y-intercept, whichever, you, whichever your teacher has used. Okay, so now, here is a beautiful little thing that helps us remember or understand what exactly is going on. So let's talk about if m is smaller than naught. Okay, so if m is smaller than naught, then we've got a negative gradient. That means that the gradient 
is negative, which means it's going to slope up to the left. So I always remember left, negative. Okay, left is negative. The other way of remembering it is that the gradient is basically y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So for this to be negative, then y1 has to be, I mean x1 has to be further over, okay, and further up. Never mind, just remember it left and negative. Okay, so now, now let's look at this column here. Let's look at this column. So if C is bigger than naught, then it means it's going to cut the graph above the x-axis, right? Whereas if C equals naught, then it's can cut at the x-axis. And if C is smaller than naught, then it's going to cut below the x-axis. So remember C tells you where you're cutting on the y-axis, okay? If M equals naught, then we have a line that is parallel to the x-axis, okay? And obviously, if c equals naught, then it's just going to be the x-axis because then you won't have anything. You'll just have y because this will be zero and this will be zero. Okay, so that's why there's a gap here. If c is greater than naught, then obviously we're cutting above the x-axis. And if c is less than naught, then we're cutting below the x-axis. Okay, now let's talk about if the gradient is positive. If the gradient is positive, it slipes, slipes up to the right, is positive. So it's up to the right. And the reason I say left negative is because they've both got Fs, Es. I mean, left negative, okay? And then exactly the same rule. When C is greater than zero, we cut above the x-axis. When C equals zero, we cut on the x-axis. And when C is more than zero, we cut below the x-axis. So guys, this is just a little summary of what you guys should know already from grade nine. Um, it really is straight line graphs are really the easiest forms of your functions. But now, there are a couple of ways that we can find our straight line equations. And you actually need to know all the methods because sometimes your teacher might say, I want you to use a dual intercept method. Sometimes the teacher will say, you want to use the gradient intercept method. And sometimes the teacher will say, "Don't, I don't mind how you do it. In which case, you guys can choose what you prefer. So now we're going to talk about, first of all, the dual intercept method. The dual intercept method says we're going to first find out, well, we're going to see where it cuts the x-axis and then where it cuts the y-axis or vice versa. So the first thing we do is find the y-intercept by letting x equals 0. So if we do that, we've got 3 times 0 plus 2y equals 6. Therefore, 2y equals 6. Therefore, y is equal to 3. So now we know that this graph cuts at y equals 3. Then we're going to let y equal 0 and find out where it cuts the x-axis. So we're going to go 3x plus 2 times 0 is equal to 6. Therefore, 3x is equal to 6. Therefore, x is equal to 2. So then we've got this. And then all we have to do is join the dots. Whee! And again, you use a ruler so you don't end up with a horrible graph like mine. So please note, and this is important, you do not need to put the equation in the standard form. Okay, you just substitute x equal to zero into it, then substitute y, find where it cuts the x-axis and the y-axis and join the dots, okay? Do not need to put the equation into standard form. Now let's talk about the gradient intercept method. So again, you got 3x plus 2y equals 6, but this time we have to convert the equation into the standard form, okay? So therefore we can say 2y is equal to minus 3x plus 6. All I'm doing is taking this across. I'm solving for y. And then remember the standard form is what? y is equal to mx plus c. So to get this into its standard form, what do we need to do? We need to divide both sides by 2. So this cancels with this, and you're left with minus 3 over 2x plus 3, because 6 divided by 2 is 3. So we immediately know that it's going through 3, right? Now what I need to do, I need to find out where it cuts the x-axis. In order to do that, I let y equal 0. So now I go, okay, fine, I've got naught is equal to minus 3 over 2x 
plus 3. So minus 3 is equal to minus 3 over 2x. I'm going to times both sides by minus 2 over 3 because this will cancel with this. And 3 will cancel with this and the minus cancel the minus. What I do to the one side, I have to do to the other side. So I'm times in this by minus. Uh, 2 over 3, the minus cancel the minus, 3 cancel 3, and I'm left with x equals 2, so here's my 2, and it's exactly the same as what we had last time. Okay, now they ask us to write the domain. Well, this is pretty easy because there's a straight line going on from ever to forever. So the domain is going to be x is an element of real values for, oh, I need more space, um, for x is smaller than infinity and bigger than minus infinity, okay? And the range is going to be identical except for y. y is an element of real values. For y is smaller than infinity and bigger than minus y. Okay, grade 10s, that's it for today, I think. We will carry on with functions and get to slightly more complicated functions. We're going to do vertical lines, etc., and then we'll get on to the parabolas, etc., etc., and how things affect the parabolas, like how the value of your a affects it, etc., etc. Right, so please join me again on, what's today, Wednesday? So join me on Monday, and we'll carry on with that. Have a great day.